Good evening. My name is Tim Wallach. I'm a trustee of the library. What a treat. I too have canoe with my family at the far end of the South Fork, pursuing meandering over rough little creeks in search of hidden worlds. When my boy was younger, we would pretend we were in the Amazon, slightly concerned as we delved deeper and deeper that we would never find our way back to civilization. Alas, I regret to report we never found any lost worlds. But Mac Griswold did. There she was in 1984 on Shelter Island, not exactly, even back then, undiscovered territory. And yet, as a naturalist, she recognized those boxwoods, and that in turn led to the hidden vault, documenting, documenting the history of a property held by the same family for 11 generations since 1666. And here as well was a record of a northern slave plantation, providing insight into that institution which was present not just in the South, but right in our backyard. It is a fascinating tale, beautifully told. I present an actress. Tim, thank you so much. That was a really moving and lovely, including the canoe introduction. <laughs> that was terrific, and I especially want to thank Sarah Halliday for organizing all of this, and uh, the trustees of the New York Society Library, one of the great institutions in New York, and by far the coziest of all of the book repositories we have. Well, let's see, could we have fewer lights? You need it, yes. Hmm? You need it, Mike. You need it, Mike. Oh. Is that better? Yeah. yeah. OK. Well, yeah. what Tim has to say is true. I came by water, and after I got there, the stories just began to pour out of this house that you see on the screen. In a painting that was painted in 1885 by a shelter islander who was also a cook on a private yacht. And wasn't it nice that he was given time or took time or made the time to paint this extraordinary painting. So, Okay, it's a cradle of American history that holds a very remarkable story. And it dates back to earliest colonial times, even back before 1666 when it became a manor, to 1651 when it was bought for 1,600 pounds of Muscovado sugar from Barbados, very coarse brown sugar. At the same time, and I'm divigating a little bit from what I usually say, but there we are, at the same time, 1,600 pounds of Muscovado sugar would buy 8,000 acres all of Shelter Island. But on Barbados, that's about a, that's, as I remember, it's a quarter of a teaspoon an acre for Shelter Island. But in Barbados, a 42-acre plantation set up with, you know, to produce sugar cost a cup of sugar per acre. So Shelter Island was really worth nothing except as a provisioning plantation and a place for, for parliamentarians to run to from the royalists who were controlling Barbados. Okay, now with the real talk. Here we go. <laughs> so what do we see here? We see, I think I have a red eye. <clears throat> yeah, I do. Here we go. There's a bunch of sheep and there's the old dairy and there's a dog guarding the sheep. And this is a picture of perfect pictorial beauty. And nonetheless, on the spine of my book is Julia Dyde Havens Johnson, daughter of freed slaves. She was the manor housekeeper, off and on throughout four generations of Sylvester descendants. And wonderfully, she was described by the local memory keeper whom I met, Evan Case, the people here from Shelter Island who might know Evan Case. Evan Case said, Julia, she was fierce and feared. So she looks very, as I say in the caption, she looks very objectified here as though she's been posed 
to be part of a suite of furniture, or uh, the picture of the old slave. Um, the 19th century was entranced with the idea that there had been slavery there. They were not the least repentant. It was part of their history. And they thought that Julius somehow conveyed the idea of the Civil War ending well for everyone with a United States and not two separate countries. So she was, she was a symbol for the people who lived there in that generation. And I guess in this 50th anniversary year of the March on Washington, and just as the nation has seen voting restrictions passed in Texas that make it close to impossible for the poor or for people of color to cast their ballots, it seems an apt time to talk about slavery <coughs> in the North and to point out, as Tim said, that the American system of slavery penetrated every region of our nation in its first 200 years not just the South. My book about the history of Sylvester Manor on Shelter Island has taken me to three continents across four centuries and more than 10 years to research and write a, forgot a forgotten story that is still in plain sight. It's still there. That's the remarkable thing about this place. It's still there with all the stories, all the water, that's the original water landing, and 243 acres surrounding it. So, as a landscape historian, I discovered that the journey to all those places and through all those years brought me back to the manor and to its lands, which were shaped early on by many hands, many often, most often, those of Africans and African Americans, and some indentured servants and some Irish slaves during Cromwell's clearances in the 1660s. Uh, Irish men and women were wholesale removed from the land and the slaves taken in just wars, as it was called, they were sold in America. And Nathaniel Sylvester, the first proprietor of Shelter Island, and his wife, Rizelle Brindley, had an Irish woman who was enslaved on Shelter Island. So it's a, quite an extraordinary set of circumstances. <coughs> so today, it's the same color, you might notice, that it was in 1885. And behind the house is that original water landing that, that uh, supplied the West Indies, because this was one of what was called provisioning plantations that supplied the West Indies with barrel staves to make the barrels for every kind of sugar product and with uh, wheat and salted grain, uh, salted meat to feed uh, the slaves on the plantations. And in return, they received sugar and also manufactured goods from abroad. The interesting thing about what's happening today, oh, I see, I'll take it down. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, is that, in a sense, it's both reparations and renewal in that the current owner has given the papers, 77 linear feet of papers, which we'll see a bit of in a minute, to New York University, where I was today, where they're being researched and digitized, and it's a finding aid, and you can go look at them yourself without an appointment in the Fayos Library at NYU. He also sold the 243 acres of land, or almost all of it, to be in agricultural easements forever. He sold it to the, David, you're a trustee, he sold it to the town, the state, and the feds, right? Actually, he sold the development rights. He sold the development rights to the land, so that it can never be developed. But he turned over, and here we have somebody who can tell you a little bit more about it, he turned over the profits of that sale of development rights to the nascent nonprofit foundation of which David Camp is a member of the board and the fallow acres that have been cultivated for over a century are now bursting with organic turnips and pumpkins and you name it at this time of year and cold hardy greens which are being sold uh, in a, at a farm stand. So reparations, the return of the papers and renewal, the farm. So, where is it exactly? I have a feeling that many of you know where Shelter Island is. 
This looks like an audience that probably knows Michelle Brown. Yeah, please your hands, please. Oh, all right, that's wonderful. Well, you could say, as I usually say to people who don't know Shelter Island quite so well, that it lies somewhere, <coughs> somewhere between Levittown on Long Island and the Hamptons, that jittery playground of the rich and famous. But as you can see, it also has a larger world. Um, there is Barbados. I'm, hang on to my arms, it doesn't shake. That's what happens when you're my age. So there's Barbados and the West Indies, the source of all this sugar wealth all those teacupfuls of brown sugar. And going up to, that's Newport, which was the largest slave port until it was eclipsed by Charleston in the late 18th century. And there is Long Island. And so it was right on the curve of the Gulf Stream and a wonderful place to take a boat very speedily from the West Indies laden with all the sugar, right straight up to Shelter Island. <coughs> Some boxwoods, eh? <laughs> Tim mentioned that it was the boxwoods that drew me. I'm a cultural landscape historian. And so when I tiptoed ashore and hollered and nobody was home, I came around the corner and I looked at these boxwoods and I thought, oh my god, and I crawled underneath. And landscape historians, like everybody who's an expert in any field, have certain things that they judge by. And to say what it is they know about certain aspects of their field. So when I found trunks underneath that boxwood this big, I knew even though the climate was very soft, etc., that those boxwoods had been there for a very long time. So I thought, hmm, this is very interesting. So then later, I saw the photographs of boxwoods that the Sylvester descendants had taken over many, many years. And on that first visit, when the Fisks were not around, those were then the owners, I saw this path that just went straight backwards into 200 years of history. But, of course, I did not know these people because when you come by water, there is no mailbox. <laughs> so I went to the local IGA, which stands right outside the gates, of Sylvester Manor, and I found out who they were, and I wrote to them. And then I wrote to them again, and when I wrote to them the third time, I heard from them, and I was invited to come for a visit. So, who were the people who were Andy Fisk's ancestors? Well, one of them was Nathaniel Sylvester, and he learned to write in Amsterdam, where this secretary, <coughs> as it's called, uh, usually less ornamented, was what every merchant was taught so that he could keep track of his accounts. <coughs> he and, th and three partners bought the 8,000 acre island to supply the West Indies, as I said. And the West Indies trade drove what we've come to call the Atlantic world. This giddy slide sh shows you image, we now call them, sorry. Uh, this giddy image shows you the incredible number of currents that can take you around the Atlantic Basin because those people didn't think of it as going from here to there. They thought of it as going round and round and looking at the manufacturing that they could take westward and the raw goods they could take eastward. So, oops. There, oh, I know, here's a, here's a, here's a red eye. There is the Gulf Stream, and there's the North Atlantic Drift, which will take you to Europe. Um, and there's the, the current that will take you up to the British Isles. But throughout the world, people paid, paid, paid in the 17th century, people paid a lot more attention to the currents than we do now. We think of people only paying attention to the wind, but a current could take you as fast and far if the wind was okay as a good fast wind could take you. So, Nathaniel, the youngest of the four partners, became the resident partner. I imagine that they said to him, you raise the sheep, you raise the meat, you run the force, it's cold up here, we're going back to Barbados, or we're going to London. 
So he was happy to do that. He loved this place. But he was a hard-driving man with a nose for business and for canny land purchases throughout Long Island and New Jersey. From his will, it's hard to, to know much about somebody who didn't leave letters and who didn't leave a journal and whose immediate family didn't talk much about him. But from his will, the wills are just marvelous, the things they say. We could tell, I could tell, you could tell if you read this will, that he was used to absolute authority, which can inform us also as to how he may have behaved towards people in bondage. He wanted to create a kingdom. <clears throat> the words that he put in his will that should any part of, his, of this island be sold by any of his children, meaning the boys, it shall be as if that child had never been born. Now, I've looked at a lot of wills, and I've talked to a lot of people who have looked at 17th century wills, the Patriarchal Society, if ever there was one, but nobody has written a will with a phrase like that. So it's, it's, it stands out as what it means about the treatment of other people to me. He was very successful. In the first two decades, Buildings were built and demolished and revamped, and it was just a frenzy of construction. You could say it was really something out of the TV show, This Old House, This Old House. Some of the carpenters and iron workers and masons were enslaved Af Africans coming north through the Caribbean trade. By 1685, it looked much like this. We know this from another will, his wife's will. She walked through the house in a memory walk, really, giving the things in the house to her various children because all the furnishings in the house belonged to her. So it was an imposing house that only a merchant with a hand in the West Indies trade and a slave labor force could have afforded. It was demolished in the 1730s and so to build the house that you saw earlier, which is still standing there from 1737 till now. He was Nathaniel and Grizel's grandson, Brindley Sylvester. Now I want you to follow me on a tour of the house, the existing house, as I first saw, saw it with Andy Fisk. Andy and I stood in this beautiful room whose walls are covered with only two coats of paint since the panels were set in the walls about 1740. The undercoat is a Prussian blue that was, was very familiar and famous throughout the mid-18th century. And they left it. They just left it. And in the 19th century, by which time the house was becoming a venerated object, like a wonderful old aunt or something, they covered it with this green colored paint, which is still there to this day. Then Andy took me down the dark central hall, and he took me past family portraits, and behind this peeling wallpaper, in the secret vault, <coughs> the fireproof vault, which was, you could, you, the only way you could see it is that it was outlined with a thin line in the wallpaper and there was a keyhole the size of your little fingernail. And Andy produced the key from his pocket mm -hmm. and opened the door with a tremendous clang and creak and bang, which it still has to this day. And I think Andy rather liked the drama, not only of his own history, but of that lock. You know, because it just took so much effort to pull it out. So inside, inside, there were trunks and trunks and uh, chests of drawers and uh, file cabinets all filled with family papers. The ceiling's only about seven feet tall. There are terrazzo tiles on the floor. There's one 60-watt bulb, and the walls pressed in around me. And I felt surrounded completely by the weight of history. Little did I know. But then we traveled on. We closed the door, clang, creak, bang. And on we went into the West Parlor, where I signed the guest book. And then I turned to admire the mantel, which lies off to the right here, and a fine door with two oval holes cut in the transom above the door. They were cut in the 19th century, is what we surmise, as circulation holes, air holes. Because uh, Shelter Island, as those of you who know it, can be just as hot as any place else. It's very, very hot in the summertime. But there's a breeze off the water, and the breeze could come through those holes. So 
Walking towards the door, Andy said, this leads to the slave staircase, as if it were the most natural thing in the world to have a slave staircase in your early Georgian house on Long Island. A breeze suddenly blew through the window that overlooks the creek, the window that you see there at the back of the room, lifting the organdy curtains with a breath. And the openings in that transom suddenly became eye holes in a mask, studying Andy and me. The staircase behind that door <clears throat> spirals up to the attic, three, fl three flights, very high steps, as you can see on the left, here, that's the ground floor. That's the flight that leads up to the attic. Don't miss the riding prop that is used as a light pole over here. Uh, but I should say that nobody walks up this pinched back staircase anymore. The steps are blocked by a collection of small vases and crystal that glitter in the light coming into the passage from the, the, the landscape parlor that leads to the outdoors and to the creek. Later, I couldn't help but notice the luxurious four-inch risers on the front staircase and the difference between these risers, which are a good 10 inches high, and those four-inch risers, to me is emblematic of the difference for people trying to make their way in the world between the Africans and enslaved Indians climbing this staircase and people like most of us here, climbing the front staircase. So we went on up to the attic, and that was when it began to sink in. As I listened to Andy's glancing mention of the staircase, I realized that I was face to face with slavery in the North, before the discovery of New York's African burial ground in 1992. Slavery in the North had been considered a passing phenomenon pushed by a pressing need to clear the land, not as a powerful social structure that lasted for more than 200 years. Northern slavery was largely obliterated. So how come we don't know about it? Northern slavery was largely obliterated from memory because it didn't serve the North's version of the Civil War. Although the fight for African-American freedom began in New England, the story of race relations in this region was put aside and slavery, in a sense, became the skeleton in the attic. Once the trunks were opened, the documents began to reveal their secrets. Some of the papers in this particular trunk have probably, see a little string, precious string tied and retied around them? Many of them had not been untied since somebody had read them and put them in those bundles. It was incredible. Among the papers that I saw was a copy of the will of Nathaniel <coughs> Sylvester, of the will of Nathaniel Sylvester that names the, the that lists the names and families of those he held as chapel. So some of them emerged as real people, more than surmises, and among them are, ooh, sorry, are Jaquero and Hannah and their two girls, Isabel and Hope. You pause at the name Jaquero, where does it come from? He probably was a man who spoke five or six languages, two or three African languages, Portuguese or Spanish, to judge from the O ending, maybe French, Jacques, and also English. A lot of these people called Atlantic Creoles in the first generation of slavery in, in the, on the American continent probably spoke more languages than any of the people who called themselves their captors, their owners. So that's Jaquero and Hannah, and they arrived in 1653, the first to arrive. The person most, of most interest to us is one of these four children, um, Obi, mentioned here. Tamero and Oyu have African names. Obium is an African name of unknown origins. Oyu, I've been told, is probably a woman from the Oyo Empire, and it may be that when she was asked what her name was, she said, I am Oyo, 
hence her name. So the extraordinary thing about these people, these are among the founding families of America, like many other founding families whom we more usually consider to be founding families. So, like the Sylvester's. So Jupiter Hammond grew up on Lloyd Neck and was the first published African-American poet um, in this country. So, I also, when I saw this list, I realized that I had my own doubts and ambivalences about who I am, because I'm the descendant of six generations of slaveholders in the South, going from Virginia in 1697 all the way to Texas by, uh, the, by the Civil War. And so whenever you look at a list like this, and it's an enormous list for a slaveholder in New England, the largest number of enslaved Africans in New England in 1680 at that time, I wonder what I would have been like. And I think when you read my book, you will probably think about that yourselves. Who, who would you have been? What would this have meant to you? Good to think about. Well, we left the house. Now I have to come over here and scream because I can't see it. Can you still hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right, good. Andy and I left the house. I'm sorry. <laughs> we left the house. Here's the house. Here's the Gardner's Creek that Tim and I both probably went up. Here is the water landing. Here's something called the African Garden, and I'll talk about it in a minute. Here's the garden with its path going straight through it. There's the path. And Andy and I took off, and we walked around one of the many ponds. Great place to raise livestock and have enough water. If you were going to ship beef on the hoof or horses down to the West Indies, you needed a lot of water to, to supply your animals and to cask it to put it on the ships. So we walked around here, around that pond, and we approached the edge of the creek again. And the first place we came to was the so-called Quaker Cemetery, which, to my knowledge, only holds one Quaker. It was, <laughs> it was really the family cemetery. And as somebody here in the audience knows, uh, it held the, the, um, the remains of the Brindley and his wife, uh, Mary, but Nathaniel and Griselle's um, remains and stones have never been found, and I'll tell you why in a minute. There are three points on this map. There's the house, there's the Quaker Cemetery, and there's the burying ground of the colored people of the manor since 1651. So it's a kind of a tripod holding this place up, a place of of mixed good and evil, I would say. <coughs> so you come to the Quaker graveyard, which is so extraordinarily beautiful. And there's a good reason, actually, for it to be called the Quaker graveyard, despite the absence of Quakers. It commemorates Nathaniel Sylvester as a Quaker protector. But in fact, he was one of the, among the first dozen people on this side of the Atlantic to be, to, to be a, a member of the Society of, Friend, of, of Society of Friends, which was barely formed at that time. And his wife was also. They were among the earliest Quakers who could also uh, give protection to other Quakers because they were on an island which Nathaniel Remember, he's quite a ruthless guy, and he's a guy who's used to his own way. And he said, this is under my own protection. And for some reason, which I explain in the book, nobody came over and arrested those Quakers which were being persecuted and hanged in Boston. That you'll have to read. So who were the Quakers who arrived? Among them were, how many people here know who Mary Dyer was? Great, OK, a couple of people do. Um, Mary Dyer was an English woman who came to America, gave birth to four or five children, was a friend of Anne Hutchinson. Um, Anne Hutchinson rose in the church when she was banished from Boston, Boston. And who took her hand and walked out with her? Mary Dyer. So 
Mary Dyer was a brave woman. She went back to, she went back to England, and she was converted as a friend, and she came back to Shelter Island and to America, and she was banished from Boston on pain of death. So she went to Shelter Island in December of 1659, and she stayed there, and she thought about what she should do. And she said, I must go to Boston to burn as a candle for the Lord. So she left Nathaniel and Grizel and the other Quakers who were there. She crossed the Sound. She got on her horse. Somebody provided her with a horse. And off she went to Boston, where she was hanged on Boston Common, the first woman to be hanged on Boston Common, and one of the handful of Quakers who were hanged there. And when she, this is my second little breeze. You remember the breeze that animated that curtain? Well, the day that Mary Dyer was hanged in May, lovely May day, a wind blew through the common and her skirt quivered in the breeze. And somebody said, scornfully said, she hangs like a flag. <laughs> and somebody else, probably a Quaker, said, she hangs like a, like a flag for men to do justice by. And it wasn't too long before Quakers were no longer persecuted in Boston. There were Baptists. There were Jews in Newport. There were people of all different kinds invading and enlivening the Puritan oligarchy. And I won't say it was all Mary Dyer, but surely she contributed, as you will find out in my book. And then there's George Fox, who also visited the Sylvesters, had a terrible storm beating back to Fisher's Island where he was eaten by mosquitoes, <laughs> and uh, finally made his way to Shelter Island and then went back down south. So you know that Long Island, that Long Island Sound is called the Devil's Highway because the currents of Long Island Sound are absolutely incalculable. You can end up um, in a, well east of Block Island before you know it. So, here's another paradox. Gospel family order being a short discourse concerning the ordering of families, both of whites, blacks, and Indians. Today, it really seems like a conflict for the Sylvesters to have owned and traded in slaves and been Quakers. I mean, most of us are startled by this fact. Um, but in, in fact, not until 1758, when the Philadelphia meeting finally said that those who held slaves or dealt in slaves could no longer be members of the Society of Friends. It took a century from the time that George Fox, in 1647, first felt the inner light. And for us, it seems like one of those extraordinary paradoxes. How could they be Quakers? And how could they hold slaves? How many of you have an iPhone? iPhones are made in China by Chinese children. We live with paradoxes every day. And, and uh, there's a way to understand compartmentalization if you think about the iPhone. So we spent some time at the Quaker Monument where the steps are encircled by uh, wonderful inscriptions that give you the, the detail, the sufferings of the Quakers in Boston. Um, and they were scourged, they were maimed, they were tied to the cart, they were, uh, they were hanged. But as we stood there under the oaks, and Andy talked about the manor as a haven for the Quakers, it did cross my mind that he and his 19th century, for, he and his 19th century forebears who put up this monument were more horrified by the physical punishment of Quakers and other dissidents than by any cruelty to their family slaves. What's interesting is that no records of punishments exist in the papers, but again, this is another sidelong light, like looking at Nathaniel's will to find out what kind of person he was. The ferocious colonial legislation modeled on that of the West Indies that was passed at the end of the 17th century tells us what was permitted and encouraged within the law to do to a person considered as chattel. Well, on we went, Andy and I, 
leaving the Quakers through the pines and the oaks with an occasional glimpse of the house, that beautiful house, through the trees. By the time Andy's house was built in the 1730s, Long Islanders owned more human chattel than any other group of colonists in the north. In outlying areas such as Shelter Island, up to half the workforce was enslaved. The corner of the burying ground, which as you remember, is at the entrance from, as you come into the house, there's the burying ground, then you take a right, you go up to the house, then you come back down to the Quaker burying ground. So this is tripod of which the, the most prominent point is the house, but this is the thing that first greets you. The burying ground of the colored people of the manor since 1651. Now paradoxically, because graveyards were segregated, black graveyards and white graveyards, Africans' graveyards became free spaces. They were repositories of African religious and cultural traditions. For the slaves, death freed their spirits to return to Africa. The other place that's a free place for Sylvester Manor's Africans and their descendants was a place that they could call their own that was a garden. And here, this is, we've turned slightly, so I want to guide you where we are. This is the creek that we've been seeing vertically before. Here's the manor house. Here's the land bridge where I stepped ashore. Here the, here's the garden with the boxwoods at its entrance. And here, the African garden excavation site shows where, probably, it's a little hard to tell about plow scars from 1650 uh, to 1680, but we have a bit of help. This place stayed in work until at least 1859, when one of the later proprietors, Samuel Gardner, noted planting, quote, six rows of corn in the Negro garden. So this may not be the exact spot, but it's probably pretty close to it, because there's a spring, on. there's a spring here. This is a south-facing slope. And what was called the Hawthorne Hedge ran straggly up this way. And between, another 19th century account says, between the African garden uh, and the Indian graveyard runs the Hawthorne Hedge. So we feel pretty certain, and the archaeology done by the University of Massachusetts, Boston, over nine field school years has ascertained that this is probably this other sacred place for the Africans. Now, as I spent time in the family papers, my Shelter Island world quickly widened. The four partners, as I've said to you, were in the sugar business, but they were also early global capitalists. They had good credit in the Netherlands, which was the most effective and sophisticated credit machine in the, in the Western world at the time, and in London. Their transactions around the Atlantic world included salt from Nevis, European manufactured goods, the staples that we've discussed, rum and sugar and molasses shipped to Europe and New England, as well as the West Indies, and Africans. What? Hmm. Not on my side now. Uh, one of the captive Africans in this detail of a barbo engraving is doing what so many captains of slave ships noticed, which is he or she is thinking about jumping overboard because many people would prefer to drown to leaving Africa and, and leaving their families, leaving their homeland. Nathaniel made a trip from Barbados to the Gold Coast in 1646. He sailed out of Amsterdam, making a last stop, a uh, European stop, at the Ile de Ré on the French coast, which was a center for calicos and other trade textiles that were preferred by Africans who sold their uh, countrymen or sold, sold other Africans, Africans from other tribes, to the European slave ships waiting offshore like these. 
They would have loaded rum as barter goods as well from Nathaniel's brother's warehouse in, Bar in Bridgetown. So I followed Nathaniel and made a trip to Ghana, visiting the slave forts along the coast. They are cruelly impressive, as many of you know. But I was also very aware at the same time that I was with the descendants of those who were not shipped to the Americas. In everyday life, often lived in poverty, yes, but with a living society of their own. These are the fabulous fishing boats of Ghana, famed throughout West Africa. And when you look at these fishing boats, you have to remember that they look something like the imposing war canoes manned by as many as 20 American Indians that plied the sound. So I often wonder how many Shelter Island Africans tried to gain their freedom by paddling away from the manor in Indian canoes not dissimilar to this. We don't know. The record is silent, but I often wonder. It's a form of resistance we don't often think about. So I was lucky enough to have contacts in Banda, which is close to the Ivory Coast border and near the North Volta River, where the slave crossing was, uh, as slave coffles crossed on their way to the coast. Out to Akempion, the local field superintendent of an American university prehistoric dig close to the mountains that you can just make out behind him over here on the Cote d'Ivoire border. He welcomed me. Now, rural life in, in Africa is not what African life was like in the 17th century, and I'm not trying to pretend that it was, what Tamaro and Oyu and Tequero and the others were forced to leave. But for me as a landscape historian, it had the peace of country life. It had the smell of the earth and the clouds of red dust, which are everywhere in Africa, and the yams and cassava uh, fields, and dinner together um, in the shade of the neem tree when the air, when the air cooled. I, I don't mean to suggest that Ghanaian life is an idol. Ghana has its troubles like many other African nations. But throughout the book, I wanted to give you a sense of the personal of life as it might have been from minute to minute. Resourceful, steady people from all parts of Africa somehow managed to remake that same cultural atmosphere in, in America for themselves. In the North, however, that meant rarely, as slaves spent their lives both by day and by night together with their captors, unlike in the South where they had quarters to which they could retreat and be as families together. That attic we saw is the place where people lived. It was under surveillance at all times. So this seems like a far cry from the beautiful manor house that I started off with and from these boxwoods. So returning to Sylvester Manor, I followed the thread of many stories, but this particular one that I've mentioned tonight of slavery, emancipation, racism, prejudice, and today still silent prejudice, as it was woven, then forgotten through the 360 years at this one site since Shaquero and his wife Hannah and one of his two daughters, Hope, set foot on Shelter Island in the summer in July of 1653. We do at least know that. So how about the archaeology, briefly? There is the wonderful Alice Fisk, a redoubtable gardener and digger in her own right. And she is the one who funded the Andrew Fisk Memorial Center for Archaeological Research at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. And the extraordinary collection of dots on the other screen shows you all the shovel test pits um, on the North Peninsula, where the African garden was. In the in the, in the garden, there was some uh, field testing, geophysical testing, but um, Alice didn't really want her garden dug up. She was a very good gardener. Mm -hmm. So, but right outside the gardener, garden was this huge slaughter pit, which tells you about the almost commercial aspect of, of uh, supplying the West Indies with meat. The carcasses of th thousands and thousands of bones, let's put it that way. Um, of sheep, primarily sheep and, and pigs. And then 
The other interesting thing, you'll notice that there's a huge concentration here, which is the midden. There's Cat Hayes wondering how on earth they're going to lift this 800 pound block of soil out of the ground, which includes this layer like sliver of the lives of hundreds of people lived here, who lived here, tossed out the windows. As Steve Rozowski, who was the archeologist on site said, he said, nothing is ever lost. And so, and I think archeologists do truly believe that. So to everyone's surprise, with over 800 acres of land to spread out in, all activities, all construction, all exchanges between people and cultures took place on top of each other, right here, right at that site, uh, on the inlet where I landed and where the 18th century house now stands. That's the house there. Archaeologists didn't pay much attention to the house in this one, did they? They were much more concerned with what are called shovel test pits. Steve's digs, these digs, would unearth the often, as he called them, voiceless conversations that had taken place on Shelter Island between Europeans, Indians, and Africans, struggles over power and the use of space that were revealed by the artifacts and the faint, multi-layered evidence of fences, roads, and buildings. There's the house. Here, and here's this tiny area, and here's this 800 pound block of soil. It's sort of surprising that it weighed that much, isn't it? So, how on earth were they going to get it out of there? Well, the archaeologists arrived with something that looked like a photographer's trunk. Mm. And with much groaning and sweating, they managed to get it aboard, take it up to the lab, and all kinds of things have come out of it, which you'll have to read my book to find out. <laughs> But for me, the house was always my best teacher and source of information. And she only yielded her secrets slowly. And I almost missed this one. Andy was much more interested in what he had to show me here than he was in the fact that this was slave housing or even then in the architecture because he was a sailor. So there's Isaac Farrow's sloop sailing into clouds of darkness. Isaac Farrow, as you read from the, in the previous slide, was indentured at the age of five of his own free will, as the document says. And he lived there all his life, and he covered the walls of the dormer with these beautiful sailboats. And every time I would go up to the attic, he died at Sylvester Manor. He lived there all his life, and is probably also buried in the burying ground of the colored people of the manor since 1651. I always said to myself, sail away, Isaac, sail away. But of course he could not. So we have made a complete tour of the manor, and we are back to the painting and the house as it stands now, photographed from a cherry picker. And I hope you've enjoyed the tour, and that this tour of 360 years has made some sense. And I hope you'll ask me some questions and then go out and buy some books, and I'll sign them for you. <laughs> Questions? Yes? Yes, I think I read that Thomas Jefferson wrote a letter to one of the Sylvester's. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. And it was in the vault, along with Ezra Lamadieu's big fat gold watch, and the braids of a woman who must have died in childbirth because that's when you cut off a woman's hair to give her strength. And the letter was part of the, an enlightenment exchange about uh, a common wheat pest called the Hessian fly. fly yes. That's right. So, where, were, where is that letter now? That, that letter is now at New York University along with the other papers. So you can go have a look. I certainly will. Yeah, all right. Uh, any other questions here? Yes. Yes. Had uh, Andy been focused on his, his the history of his house and family before meeting you? Oh yes. 
Oh, he had. Uh, among those papers, the ones tied up with string, were a number of papers, mostly the early 17th century ones, um, including the copy of the will, that he flattened in some of those big professional red leather albums with lead plates so that the letters could be, uh, could, could, could be straightened out. We actually have here Caroline Rieger. Raise your hand, Caroline. There you go. She unrolled some of the maps and some of the papers, and it took her as long as a year to do one of them. Yeah. yeah. So Andy was definitely a, a keeper of his family's history. So we owe a great deal to him. Yeah. Yes, David. Matt, could you talk a little bit about, I know the vault was such an amazing experience, but about opening up some of the, the envelopes and some of the tie packages, we, that must have been an incredible experience to, to sort of go back into history as each one of those packages were open. Well, first of all, I was terrified because, as Caroline knows, that paper is very, it's very you good might, paper. You oh, might. Oh, sorry. It's very good paper, but it also is very rigid paper after that length of time. But I opened one document, seven pages of legal documents. Thank God everybody was litigious. You always want to write a book about a litigious family. Because you'll find out all kinds of amazing things, including a beautiful map on page five that I should show it in this presentation, but it's quite pale and faint. And it shows the manor house exactly the same as it is today. And it shows the privy in the garden, the beautiful yellow privy, exactly where it is today. And it was dated 1828. But the thing that interested me even more than the map was the fact that this recorded a battle between an old woman who was determined to retain her dower rights. And she said, how many lawyers do we have here today? Raise your hands. Okay, quite a few. So she insisted that dower rights include use as well as property. And that therefore she was entitled to the things that her uh, nephew by marriage said she was not entitled to. She, he said she was not entitled to use the bake oven. She was not entitled to use the privy. Mm. She was not entitled to use the root cellar. And you know what? She won. And Samuel Gardner decamped for New York uh, and spent some time there. And she went to Sag Harbor and lived out the rest of her life there. But I always thought Esther Sarah Davis, Havens Deering, whose portrait hangs at the manor, uh, was really quite a woman. And it was opening that package that took me right back. It was pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. Yes? You mentioned that the, uh, the land had been purchased, and you said that 1,600 pounds of Muscovado sugar. And who did they purchase it from? They purchased it from a man who had been the deputy uh, governor of the New Haven colony. <laughs> and he bought it as a kind of a speculative bet. He had hoped that somebody would buy the place. He bought it in 1641 when it came out of the Earl of Stirling's um, inheritance. The Earl of Stirling, a nice Scottish poet who was knighted by Charles I, or made an earl by Charles I, um, had died without paying his uh, factor, the person who worked for him, who took Shelter Island and Robbins Island nearby, maybe some of you know Robbins Island as well, um, as his pay. So then Stephen Goodyear stepped in and he thought, aha, I'll be able to sell this island, no problem. Because islands were highly valued, remember this is a maritime world, and if you could raise animals on an island, you had a double advantage because there, you'd kill off all the predators. There would be no wolves, there would be no bears. You just got rid of them all. I think it sounds like today. Um, and so Stephen Goodyear was the one who sold to the four partners. And he also was a coastal merchant with a, with a, a toehold in the sugar trade. They were. Uh, Isaac Farrow was the descendant of one of the families, the great families of the East End. When the Sylvesters arrived, the first thing they did was to essentially impress the people who lived there 
in various ways into their workforce so that by the 1660s, as the archaeologists have shown, they were actually making wampum, which was then legal currency, um, for the Sylvesters to use in trade because the Manhansets steadily found their lives encroached upon their hunting grounds, their fields, um, their, uh, their, there's a wonderful letter by uh, the Niantic chief, Miantonomy, which I quote in full, um, about what they were losing. And it's a real cry. And so they became essentially an underclass of the Sylvesters. They continued to live on the North Peninsula, which seems to have been a kind of a refuge for minority people, uh, the place where the African Garden was. When the archaeologists went to the peninsula, they found um, occupation dating back to, dating back a thousand years, but right up to the time of the Sylvesters. And one of the interesting things is that I'm t I'm, I'm, I should stop. I'm going to stop later. I'll just finish. I'll finish this. Um, in the Pequot War of 1637, in which most of the of the New England Indians engaged in various ways uh, on all sides of the Sound, many of the warriors were killed, and others were sent as slaves to the West Indies. So many Indian women of all tribes on both sides of the Sound married African men. And so when you say the burying ground of the colored people of the manor since 1651, you are describing two minorities, not one, who lived and worked as chattel or as impressed for a very long time, for two centuries. There's more in the book. <laughs> A lot. I mean, a lot of talk about it in here. So I think probably I should answer any other questions outside. Um, and thank you all. Very much.